Hello and welcome to my channel IELTS Listening. Let's start with one of the best practice tests for improving listening skills. The test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. You will hear a conversation between an agent from City House Services and a customer who wants to have her house cleaned. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Good morning, City Health Services. How may I help you? Good morning. I'd like to arrange to have my house cleaned. Certainly. I just need to ask a few questions. First, could I take your name? Yes, it's Barbara Hill. Thank you. Next, is your house in London? Yes, it's in Kingston in southwest London. Okay, southwest London, and uh, what's the postcode? SW105. And what is the square footage, and what rooms will be cleaning? The whole house is 268 square feet, and there is no need to clean all the rooms. I only want to have my bedrooms cleaned. Okay. How many bedrooms does the house have? Three bedrooms. Oh no, sorry, we, we used to have three bedrooms, but we only have two bedrooms now. Are those single bedrooms or doubles? Doubles. Fine, two doubles. There's one more room which needs cleaning. It was used as a bedroom before, and now we have converted it into an office. I understand. Three rooms have got to be cleaned. And are all of those rooms upstairs? Yes. Then downstairs we have a kitchen diner, conservatory and lounge. The kitchen diner is quite large and has the usual equipment, cooker with oven, refrigerator, cupboards and worktops. The conservatory has a lot of plants but there's no need to take care of them. The lounge has a leather three-piece suite and a large coffee table. Thank you. And do you keep any pets? Yeah, I really love keeping them. I've got two dogs and three cats. OK. Then if our staff come over to offer the service, please take your pets away. Uh, have you looked at our service packages? Yes, I have one in front of me. Excellent. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Any extra services you need? Switching bed linen, work in the garden, clean the glass in the conservatory, that kind of thing? Uh, no. Uh, actually, replacing the bed linen, yeah, that would be good. No problem. I'll just make a note of that. How about curtains, mats and carpets? What would you like us to do with those items? The curtains. Oh, I'll have to think about that. I think we should have the carpets cleaned really well every quarter. Mats can just be done with the laundry. Of course. How about clothes? We can have our staff wash and iron them, or we can have them taken to a dry cleaner. Washing and ironing. No, just ironing. That'll be OK. OK, fine. I know quite a bit about what you want now. I should let you know that we're located on 12 Amy's Road. That's A-M-Y-E-S. Mm. And we work on from Monday to Sunday, except Tuesday and Wednesday. Could you let me know when is convenient for you? Next Friday. Uh, no. Oh, that's no good. My son invites his friends over in the afternoon that day. Perhaps next Thursday or next Saturday? 
Let me check. Okay, next Thursday. When is it convenient for us to come over and provide the service? Is it okay if we come in the morning? Or we may come in the afternoon. It depends on your schedule. I'm okay with any time. Just give me a call to let me know you're coming before you arrive. Sure we will. By the way, how long will it take for the service? We usually work one to three hours for house cleaning and the work will take three hours at most. And of course, if it takes more than three hours, you should pay extra for it. Uh, fine. So, let me just do some calculations. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a librarian called Adam Smith talking to the students about how to use the facilities in the library. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Please come in and gather over here around the tables. My name is Adam Smith, and I'm the librarian here. I'll show you around today and explain how to use these facilities. Hopefully, when I'm done with it, you'll know the ropes. And please feel free to let me know of any questions or concerns that you may have. Now we are at the gate of the library. Upon entering into the door, you'll find that the restrooms are on your left-hand side, and opposite them is a photocopy room. Many of you are wondering about the check-in and check-out process. What you have to do is go to the circulation desk, which is to the east of the photocopy room. The reading room is a really large area in the center of the library, just to the north of the circulation desk. I'm sure you won't miss it. If you're here to do research, this is where you should bring books to look through. However, if you're here to do any group projects or other interactive activities, I advise you to use one of the study rooms, which are just to the east of the reading room. Moving on to the southeast corner, we have the periodical section, just next to the study rooms. We have a collection of different newspapers and magazines in this section. You can get last week's weather reports or all the top stories five years ago. Our periodicals can be traced back 20 years to the time when our school library was built. Ah, our first question, yes. Can we check out magazines from the library? I'm sorry, but you cannot take any periodicals out of the library. You're welcome to read them for as long as you want while you're here, but you cannot check them out. I wonder if there is any place where we can get some food in the library. Do we have a store here? Of course. The Food Service Center is just meters away from the study rooms. It's on the northeast corner as you look at the map. The Food Service Center offers different kinds of snacks, though it's not big. Well, moving on along to the west, you will find the Video Resource Center on your right hand. We have educational videos and documentaries, as well as major motion pictures. We ask that you pay attention to the tag on the video that you pick up, as many of our documentaries are for on-site viewing only and may not be taken out of the library. 
To the west of the Video Resource Center is our satellite TV station. Here we stream the news from Channel 19 for most of the day. How many channels does it have? <laughs> it does have nearly 200 channels, but we generally will give top priority to channels with some big events, like presidential addresses or other breaking news. During the coverage of the presidential debate, students will take a break from studying and flock to watch it. Last, but perhaps most important, is the inquiry desk. It's just on the left-hand side when you walk into the library, so it's impossible to miss it. If you have any questions about how to use equipment or where to find something, come and ask the assistant. Don't be shy, because that's what they're here for. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Speaking of questions, one of the questions we get asked is how to actually check out a book once a student has picked one out. If it's a fiction or non-fiction book, look for the pink and yellow checkout card inside the back cover of the book. You can also find information about the book on these cards, including its publishing date, genre, ISBN, and a log of dates it's been checked out before. Present this card to me or any library assistant, and we'll stamp it, and then the book can be kept for three weeks. You can find general information on a field of study by using one of our subject guides. We have them on paper here, but any of our computers will allow you to search within fields as well. What if the library doesn't have a resource we're looking for? Great question. I'm going to address that. Our library is a network with a number of other universities in the area, so if there is something you're looking for and it's available somewhere in the area, we'll be able to get it for you. However, there are universities which are not part of the network, so we do not share resources with them. If you want more information about the library and its resources, you'll find it in a labeled blue folder on my desk in the Enquiry section. Okay, so that's a lot of information all at once, and I don't expect you to remember it all. The most important thing is please be respectful of the staff, and if you need help with anything at all, come and ask me or one of the assistants. All right, any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear an introduction to a conference on computer system language learning. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Good morning everyone and welcome to the second annual Wallabaloo Conference on Mastering Computer Languages. I hope you all had a good trip. 
Before we get underway with today's programme, let me fill you in as to what's on tap for tomorrow, Sunday, February 19th. At 9am, right here in the main hall, we'll be hearing a lecture from Dr John Smith about computer as teacher. Professor Smith from the University of Melbourne is a world-class expert in the field of computer-assisted education, and his talk promises to be both stimulating and informative. Immediately afterwards, at 10.30, there will be a presentation of papers by various delegates. That, however, will take place in the garden room on the ground floor. If you don't yet know, the garden room is also called the ballroom and will be gathering at the west end, the slightly raised area called Level 2. Just look for the crowd. If you get lost, there are signs in the foyer. After all that thinking, talking and listening, I expect everyone will be a bit weary. So at 11.15, there will be a break for coffee, cookies and other light refreshments. These will be available at the aptly named refreshment stand, placed by the door back here in the main hall. Also, if you choose to skip the formal lunch, you can buy a packed lunch at the stand for a reasonable price. I strongly urge you, however, to join us at the formal lunch. That won't be till one o'clock sharp, so you have time to stroll about town a bit. We'll be eating at the Seaview restaurant. The restaurant is located right here in the hotel on the top floor. It's a good dozen flights of stairs, so I suggest you take the lift on the ground floor, eh? If you're not fond of fish, there's an all-you-can-eat barbecue available as well. They even offer wallaby meat. After lunch, we'll troop back downstairs to level two in the ballroom for the presentation of further papers, which will begin at 2 p.m. Please try to be on time. I know you'll be a bit tired after lunch, but the ballroom echoes so with people coming in late. Thank you in advance. Once we've heard the papers, we'll break for afternoon tea at 3.10pm. No need to walk. The manager of the refreshment stand has graciously agreed to have tea served in the ballroom. He's even promised us some special scones, baked from a recipe of his dear old Scottish grandmother. Then, tea being drunk and scones munched, we'll retire here to the main hall for some closing remarks and questions. So, by five o'clock, we should have the conference wrapped up. But the fun isn't over. This is Australia, mates. We'll be flocking to the hotel's own Palm Lounge on the east side of the foyer for an informal reception. You can relax, mingle with the other delegates and let your hair down a bit. This will run from 5.10 to 6.10, though you're free to stay as long as you like. The lounge manager has informed me that for the duration of the actual reception, you can have all-you-can-drink beer for $20 with purchase of an advance ticket. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. And yes, tickets can be purchased from any conference organiser or at the front desk any time between now and the start of the reception. I suggest you come by tomorrow evening to pick up the tickets, since the conference hall only holds 800 people. That way, you can also get your journey planned ahead of time, and be sure not to miss this truly memorable conference. If you want cocktails, however, I'm sorry, you'll have to pay for those at the regular price. Oh my goodness! Speaking of paying, I see I forgot to tell you a couple of things. The first is about lunch. The charge for the lunch will be $15 for all you delegates. If you have guests with you, the cost is $25 for the general public and $6.50 for children under the age of 10. That's $15 each, not total for everyone. Another item is about the lunch menu. I very much urge you to try the fish. I mean, look at the restaurant's name, the Sea View. As the name suggests, it is a famous seafood restaurant. 
The chef is a Basque from Spain, and he really gets quite put out when people ignore his fish specialities for burgers or barbecue. If fish isn't your thing, though, try the steak. He makes an exquisite filet mignon topped with blue cheese and mushrooms. Finally, if you'd like to buy a ticket, you can have both lunch and unlimited beer for thirty-five dollars. I should have mentioned that earlier, but I am a bit forgetful. Maybe I should avoid the beer after the conference, eh? Well, I've said my bit. Are there any questions? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about how to choose flooring materials. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. We've been talking about choosing building materials in the last week. Now, a great many factors influence the choice of building materials. You can't make a house of cards, right? And people who live in glass houses and all that. Anyhow, today I'd like to say a few words about flooring. Some artificial materials can be used, like plastic, for instance, which offer mixed blessings when used as a flooring surface. On the one hand, plastic is cheaper than nearly any other alternative, short of bare ground. Plastic also does not warp like wood. On the other hand, the best that can be said about plastic is that it looks like wood or stone. However, it cannot replace the real materials. As I have mentioned, I'm fixing up a new house. The decorator my wife hired told me plastic does a great job of looking exactly like plastic. Besides, it scratches easily, fades or discolors, and starts cracking within a year or two. So, if you're fitting out a sleazy hotel or plan to live in a trailer park, go with the plastic. Really, though, for all intents and purposes, this leaves us with wood or stone as choices for flooring. Stone and wood are alike in at least one respect. Both go through processing before they can be put to use. Since few of us cut our own lumber or quarry our own stone, this is not perhaps a pressing concern. Still, do-it-yourselfers would do well to remember to buy only properly seasoned wood. Unseasoned wood warps, and a warped floor quickly becomes firewood, and its owner quickly becomes poorer. Likewise, except for dull-hued materials like slate or sandstone, most stone floors are polished before installation. The choice goes well beyond just wood or stone. Each type requires many further considerations. A few special remarks are called for when considering wood. For example, as always, aesthetics, personal taste, and layout all play roles, as well as the type of house or room. Oh, and certainly don't forget the cost. When it comes to cost, a rule of thumb is that the softer and less exotic the wood, the lower the cost. In the U.S., for instance, pine is both ubiquitous and cheap. Mahogany is imported and exorbitantly expensive. If you're on any kind of budget when remodeling, it's really helpful to remember to go for the softer woods. Aside from cost, there are still lots of different factors that are important in choosing the best flooring for the job. Continuing with the example of wood, 
one must consider the effects of each type of wood on the mood of the room. When selecting the best wood to use, particular attention needs to be paid to its grain patterns, texture, and color. In rooms where relaxation or deep thought is the aim, say bedrooms or the study, dark, strong-grained woods are the rule. Here, the grain ought to match the furniture for a feeling of homogeneity. In rooms where activity and motion are typical, the dining room or living room, lighter, finer-grained lumber is more suitable. In such a setting, the wood grain might be useful in offering a contrast to the furniture. This leads to a feel of subconscious excitement in keeping with the room's function. In either case, though, consult a decorator. It is a decorator's job to know what materials to use to fit the function of the room. Though some things about putting together a room are subjective and based on one's individual taste, materials appropriate to a room's function are much more straightforward. A decorator takes the needs of the customer and uses a mathematical formula rather than subjective words. Since feelings vary from person to person, verbal descriptions of wood types tend to be ambiguous. You want the wood you select, not something approximate. And if you do decide to do it yourself, remember that all wood must be treated with preservatives to enhance its appearance and preserve its natural beauty. In the case of stone or quarry tile, as flat-cut flooring stone is properly called, a new set of considerations must be weighed up. Simple color aside, the degree of reflection must be kept in mind. This is called the reflectance rate. Which is expressed in a number between 0.0 and 1.0, depending on the amount of light it reflects. At one end of the scale is polished silver. At a rating of 1.0, this shiny surface reflects nearly all of the light directed at it. Numbers closer to zero describe materials that absorb more light. Moving down the scale a bit, we see that plastic that has been painted white has a rate of 0.8, which makes sense. We know that the color white reflects all other color, while black absorbs all color, and plastic itself is a relatively reflective material. Materials that are denser and darker have reflectance rates much closer to zero. The quarry tile I mentioned a while ago has a rate of 0.1. As you may know, quarry tile is generally dark brown and made from clay, so it is quite dense. Of course, there is considerable variation among types of quarry tile because of the hue or treatment of the clay during its creation. Does anyone have any guesses as to what material may have a rate of almost 0.0? We can guess most of these materials are black in color, but plastic, wood, and even stone reflect some light. One material with a rate of almost 0.0 is black velvet. The texture produces almost no shine at all. Carrera marble, despite its white hue, is actually lower in reflectivity than black onyx. In any case, the fact that tiles vary somewhat should not be forgotten. A highly reflective floor would not be suitable in a library. It would be indispensable in a ballroom should your home be large enough to feature one. Again, a rule of thumb is that light means lively. Since form and material follow function. One should only use the more reflective materials in rooms where the cultivation and expression of energy is important. Bear in mind too that most types of stone cost more than all but the rarest of wood. Of course, there is no reason why some rooms of a house should not feature wood floors or other stone tiles. You can even mix the two. A room with wood panels on the walls can have a beautiful stone floor. My bedroom has white birch walls and a light blue slate floor. The place looks like a Russian hunting lodge. Remember, though, go with what feels right for you. Good taste and the laws of interior design are the homeowner's servants, not his master. It's only beautiful when you decide it is. I mean, you're the one who lives there, not the decorator, right? Okay. Are there any questions? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Dear viewers, thank you for taking this listening test. Please let me know about your score in the comments section below. Keep on practicing. It's the only way to be successful. We are planning to upload more IELTS helpful videos. Please subscribe to our channel, IELTS Listening. Thank you.